If you're interviewing for a data role, there's one set of SQL questions that you know are gonna come up in your live coding interview. Window functions. And hiring managers don't just care if you can write select star from in SQL. They want you to know more than that. They care if you can solve business problems like ranking employees by performance, finding running totals, comparing this month to last month, and finding the top three products in every category. And those are the exact kind of problems that you need window functions to solve, and you're probably gonna see those in interviews. In this video, I'm gonna teach you the seven window functions that you need to know in only 15 minutes. Row number, rank, dense rank, sum, average, lead, and lag. I'll walk you through real world examples so by the end, you won't just understand how window functions work, you'll actually be able to explain them and pass your interviews. Okay, let's go. Before we get to coding, let's learn what a window function is. A window function in SQL lets you do a calculation across a set of rows related to the current row without collapsing down all the rows into one result. Think about our aggregate functions in SQL. When we use sum or average, for example, it aggregates all the rows into one output. So if we take the sum or the average across the entire data set, we're gonna have one thing returned in our result set, one number. And even if we pair aggregate functions with group by, we're still gonna have one result or one number number for every single group that we specify. So that means we lose the detail of every single individual row because we're collapsing them down into one aggregated result. Window functions solve for this limitation because they allow us to rank things and aggregate things without losing the individual detail of all the rows. So we basically keep the row level detail but still do these different calculations, which is really important because it allows us to have context around all the individual rows because then we can see how that individual row compares to the rest of its group and and the rows you know, surrounding it. Let's get to coding. All right, let's first look at our sales table. We have a sales ID, which is the primary key of the table. Sales employee ID, that's the employee ID of the employee who placed the sale or who did the sale. The sale date and the sale amount. What if we wanna create a row number for every single sale based on when the sale was made in order of our sale order date chronologically? So let's keep all the columns in our sales table and then we're gonna use our row number window function. When using window functions, you really really have three pieces to your window function formula. Number one, the calculation. What is it you actually wanna calculate or do? And then that's gonna be followed with over and inside parentheses, you're gonna have two things, which are both optional. Sometimes they make sense. It depends on your business context and also which window function you're using. So you have to decide whether to use one or both of these. The first one is partition by. If you wanna partition all of your rows into different partitions or segments or groups, that's what you're gonna put into partition by. So the second thing you need to ask is, do I need to partition my data into groups? The third thing is order by. Do you need to order all of your rows by something within each group? So the third thing you need to ask is, does order matter? So right here, we're gonna use our row number function. Do we need to partition by anything? No, we don't need to partition by anything because we just wanna rank and add row numbers for all of our sales in the entire data set. So I'm gonna remove this. By the way, these X's here are just a placeholder I'm using just to show you how it works. And now our last question, do we need to order by anything? Yes, we need to order by our sale date. And we're gonna keep that in ascending order, which is the default here. So it's gonna order all of our sales in order chronologically, and then assign a row number for every single row. And let's call it sale row number. And we can see that our first sale date is January 4th, 2023. And we have three sales on that date. Those have row numbers one through three. Notice that it doesn't take into account any ties. Then all the way at the very bottom, we have our latest sale date, which is July 28th, 2023. So it looks like it did assign the row numbers correctly in order just as we wanted to do. Now I'm gonna show you our second ranking function in SQL. In SQL, there are three different ranking functions. Row numbers, number one. Number two is rank. And I'm gonna do the exact same same thing we did for row number. The only thing I'm changing is we're using the rank function instead of row number. And now I'm updating the alias to sale rank. And I'm gonna show you the difference in the calculations. So remember how before we had January 4th, 2023, and they all had different row numbers, one, two, and three. Well, they all have the same rank value. So rank actually does consider duplicates or ties and it assigns them the same ranking value. So row number doesn't care about ties. It's just gonna show you the next chronological number. It doesn't really care if there's a tie, but rank is actually going to take into account ties and give them the same number because after all, they're all in the same ranking position and they're in the same spot. So they all get number one. And another example, if we come down to February 9th, 2023, we can see that those are also tied with number five for the ranking function. But you may have noticed there is no ranking value of two or three. We have one, 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 
and then we skip to four, and then we go to five, and then we skip to eight. So why are there missing numbers? Is this a mistake? Did SQL make an error? Or worse, did we make an error? No, no one made an error here. This is how rank works. Not only does rank account for ties and assign them the same ranking value, but after the tie, it does consider the fact that there are tied values above. So for the sale date of January 30th with the rank value of four, it does consider the fact that there are three rows or values ahead of it. So after the three ones, it does go ahead and skip to four because it considers the fact that there are three values above the four in the ranking. Let's look at our third ranking function in SQL. Our third Third ranking function is dense rank. It performs similarly to rank because it does consider ties and assigns duplicate or tie values the same ranking value, but what happens after a tie is what differentiates rank from dense rank. Dense rank is, well, you know, dense. It doesn't skip any ranking values, even if there's a tie. So after the three ones tied, dense rank goes to number two. It doesn't skip any ranking values. So row number is going to give you chronological values with no skipping, and it's not going to account for duplicates. By the way, knowing how to use these ranking functions is really great, but in interviews, they will ask what the differences are in the calculations between these three. It's actually one of the most common interview questions, and it's so easy to answer. So make sure you actually understand the differences and how they calculate. And if you're super serious about SQL and getting interview ready and building a portfolio, check out my intermediate SQL course below. Many of my students have already landed six figure jobs with $25,000 to $31,000 salary increases from their current salary. And if you're brand new to SQL and you want to start from step one at the very beginning, I highly recommend you try out my free intro to SQL course below. It's completely free and we'll build your very first data analytics mini project in SQL in only 30 minutes. Before moving on, from ranking functions, I do want to point out that we can actually add in a partition by into these window functions. So here's what that looks like. I added in partition by sales employee ID into each of these ranking functions. So now it's going to do the exact same ranking calculations, but first it's going to partition all of the data by the sales employee ID. So it's going to take this person over here, this one over here, this one over here, and then within each sales employee, then it's going to do the ranking and calculation and it's going to restart start when it moves to the next one. So looking at a quick example, we have employee E172 and we have all of their sales ranked in order because we ordered by sale date. And then we have row numbers one through eight for each of their sales. And then of course, on the day where they had two sales, 516, then we have the same ranking value for both rank and dense rank. And then after the tie, rank skips to the next row number value four, but dense rank doesn't skip any values and goes straight to three. It's it's gonna do that same process within each sales employee because that's what we partitioned by. Now let's move on to a different type of window function. Let's look into sum and average. If you're familiar with aggregate functions, you've probably seen those before, but they work a little bit differently when it comes to window functions. So actually taking our regular sum function and turning it into a window function, we can create a powerful running total column. Here's how it works. We're gonna start out with our sum function because that's the calculation we wanna do, but let's calculate the running total of the sale amount or the revenue. So we're gonna start out with our sum function with the sale amount inside the function because that's what we wanna add up in total, our sale amount. Then we're gonna use over and do we wanna partition by anything? Not yet, let's just do a running total across the entire data set of all of the sales transactions. Do we need to order by anything? Yes, we're gonna to have to order by the sale date because we wanna do the running total over time. So we wanna start at the earliest sale date and then add that running total up every new sale date. I'm also gonna order Order our output by sale date so we can really see what's going on here. Okay, let's go in order and see how this calculation is working. So we have the same running total for the first three rows because the first three rows have the same sale date. And we can see that if we add up the sale amount for each of these 18,000 plus 12,300 plus 3,900, they all add up to 34,200. Do they? I don't know. I didn't actually add these up beforehand. Let me double make sure. Yes. 34,200, I even checked it. It just didn't seem like they added up that much, but they do. Okay, so even though we're not actually partitioning by anything, it's gonna recalculate that running total for each new sale date. So since these first three rows have the same sale date, it doesn't know how to differentiate the ordering between them because they're all the same. So they're all gonna get the same running total and all of these three sale amounts on that date, those are all gonna get calculated into the end of day running total. Then the next day is January 30th, 
30th where we have a sale for $4,000. And notice how $4,000 is added to the previous end of day running total. And then our next sales are on February 9th and we have three sales. These three sales are added to the previous one and so on. So we're basically just calculating a new end of day running total every time there's a new day. This is super cool and useful for things like tracking revenue over time, tracking goals over time. So really just trying to get an updated view of how much of something you have. And I just copied and pasted the running total window function below and I switched out the sum function for the average function. And then of course I renamed my alias just to make things nice and tidy. The average window function is gonna work the exact same way except instead of calculating a running total, now we're calculating a running average. We're still ordering by sale date, so it's gonna update the average over time, starting with the earliest date, and then on the next date, it'll update the average, next date, update the average, and it's just gonna keep a running, rolling average over time. So we can see on the first sale date, January 4th, it averages these three sales together, and we get 11,400. The next day, it's gonna throw in the next sale amount for that day and update the running average. And it's gonna repeat that process until the very last day, July 28th, 2023. And our final rolling average is 8,543, which if we actually highlight this entire sale amount column, we can see the average of all of them is 8,543. And that's not a coincidence. The rolling average is updating the average based on the values it has so far. But once you get to the very end and use all of the values in the rolling average, now it's just the average. So using a running average is a really cool way to track an average over time. So that way you can see how much progress you're making and kind of get an idea of where things will end up before you're at the end of something. And of course we can throw in a partition by as well and partition by sales employee ID. So now we're doing this running total and running average over time individually for each sales employee ID. So each sales employee is gonna have a different running total and a different running average based on their data because we're partitioning their data and keeping it separate. It's like we're looking into a separate window using that data, separate window over here using that data, separate window over here using that data. Are you catching on? And this is why it's so important to not just understand how to write SQL functions, but understanding the business context behind it, because no one's going to say, can you do a sum window function in SQL in an interview? No, they're going to say, can you do the running total of blah, 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 blah. And now you have to understand what a running total is and how to do it with window functions in SQL. Okay. Now we're going to do two of my favorite window functions ever lead and lag lead and lag are used to find values before or after something. And they're so fun to use if you're working working with like timestamp data and you can calculate the differences between timestamps and take the average of those and just really get a granular view of what's going on with the product between different timestamps, which is basically my favorite kind of analytics to work with. So I'm sorry, I'll stop yapping about it and show you how to do it. So to get us started, I've already written us a query that calculates the total number of sales in dollars, the sale amount by date. So I summed up our sale amount using our regular sum function, no window function grouped by the sale date in the first column, and now we have an aggregated daily total in sales per day. Now we're gonna turn this into a CTE and store that result, and then we can use our lead and lag function to do different calculations with it. If you don't know what CTEs are, you should probably go take my intermediate SQL course. Okay, quick sanity check to make sure my CTE works. I have my CTE here with daily as, it's defined, and then select star from daily. Let's use our lead and lag functions to calculate the next day's total and the previous day's total. So for example, March 11th, we have $9,000 in sales. What if we could use lead to tell us what the next day's sales are gonna be, which is ironically also 9,000 on March 14th and the previous days, which is 27,700 on February 9th. So we can use lead and lag to grab the value before and the value after the current row. We're gonna start with our lead function. We have to specify which column we wanna lead and grab the next one for. So it's gonna be our daily total column. That is our aggregated daily total in sales. That's the column that we wanna lead. And then we have to specify how much we wanna lead by. Most of the time, you're probably gonna be leading by one, but I'll show you other options a little bit later. And then we're gonna follow with order by sale date because we have to put all of our sales in order by date. That way we can lead and grab the next 
day's sales. And I'm gonna give this the alias next day total because yes, we are leading, but what are we actually doing conceptually in the business? We're grabbing the next day's total. Going back to our March 11th example, we have 9,000 as the next day's total, which is right because if we look at the next day here, it is 9,000. And then what's the next day for March 14th? 10,000. And that's right because the next day is 10,000. Another example, April 3rd, we have 1,000. And that's right because April 16th, the next day that we actually have data for is 1000. And note that you're gonna have a null value for your last value and your first value when it comes to lead and lag respectively. So if we scroll all the way to the very bottom, we have our most recent or last sale, July 28th, 2023, and there's no next day value because there's no next day. That is the last date that we have data for because we sorted by date. So it's null, there's nothing. We don't have a next day value here. So now we can copy and paste this logic and do the exact same thing except for lag. So instead of grabbing the next day, we're gonna grab the previous day. So the opposite is kind of true here. Our first value is gonna be null because this very first day, January 4th is the first sale chronologically, we don't have a previous day total. So it's gonna be null. But if we go to the next day, January 30th, the previous day was 34,200. Yes, it was, we can see it right here. Perfect. And that is how lead and lag work. And instead of using the number one, you can update these with the number two. So now instead of leading by one row, you can lead by two rows. So if we look at March 18th, for example, our next day, two days ahead is gonna be 7,000. We go boom, boom, 7,000. Same thing with lag. The lag is 9,000 for this one. If we go back to boom, boom, 9,000. So now you know the seven most common window functions in SQL and you know how they show up in interviews. And if you can explain these concepts clearly, you'll already be ahead of most candidates. But if you wanna really stand out, you'll definitely need to know a few other things like CTEs, subqueries, and self joins because those are gonna show up in all of your interviews too. So if you wanna learn those, grab my courses below or if you need a refresher on regular joins, head on over to those in my next video. Bye.